Welcome to the STR Data Lab. Hello and welcome to another edition of the STR Data Lab. I'm Jamie Lane, Chief Economist at AirDNA, and I'm here today with a guest, Joe Riley, the founder and CEO of Patriot Family Homes. Joe, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me on. So uh, we were hanging out down at the Verma conference. I uh, saw you at the sort of closing event and really interested in diving in with you sort of the differentiation of Patriot Family Homes versus other types of property management companies. I and mean, it seems like you guys differ in so many different ways. And I, I'm really excited to sort of dive into that, not only in the business model, how you acquire properties and the and the guests that you try to go after. So, but maybe we could just start with uh, a little bit about uh, your history and why you started Patriot Family Homes and and just overall, what is it? Yeah, so um, we started originally, I was in the army, um, deployed to Afghanistan and uh, my wife traveled for work and in the kind of special operations community, the deployment links can be a little bit unpredictable in length. So it didn't, you know, it wasn't conducive to bring in a traditional 12 month tenant. So we just list, left the furniture in the home, listed the house on Airbnb and VRBO and HomeAway and quickly realized, no surprise, that there was a big need for furnished short-term accommodations around military bases with families constantly coming and going. And so came back, moved my wife and I into one bedroom of our three bedroom house because I didn't want to give up the revenue stream and started renting out the other two bedrooms and then started buying other houses there around Fort Benning and uh, where, where we were posted and transitioning those uh, from, you know, long-term rentals into short-term rentals, putting furniture, renovating them, putting furniture in them, then moved to another base, used the model there, went to another base, used the model there. Uh, and then over time realized it wasn't just military communities uh, that had this sort of transient needs-based lodging need uh, that you also find that around university towns, around med large medical centers, uh, state capitals, area where there's a lot of construction, inbound population growth, all of those things create the need for this kind of short-term accommodations. So we would be very, we would be clear to say that we are a short-term rental company as opposed to a traditional vacation rental management company, vacation management company, because most of our travel does tend to be more needs-based as opposed to leisure-based. Certainly we pick up leisure travel, uh, but even times when it's leisure travel, it's often more last minute, kind of spontaneous, uh, as opposed to, you know, planning annual family vacation to the beach or to the mountains. So you, you say that it sort of started around military bases. As you look at your business today, what percent is sort of and coming from and service members versus coming from sort of standard leisure travelers? Yeah, I mean, I would still say that the military piece is probably still certainly over 50% of the business that's somehow connected to military travel. The overall needs based is probably closer to like 75 or so as opposed to leisure. And that's going to obviously vary somewhat on markets. So some of our markets, you know, we went to because they were a military, they had a military base like Savannah, Georgia, but obviously then Savannah has a lot of leisure tourism as well, a lot of leisure travel as well. So there, it would be a more even mix of, you know, needs-based travel versus leisure. By comparison, a market like Columbus, Georgia, or Huntsville, Alabama, or Montgomery, Alabama, or Birmingham, or Memphis, tends to be a lot more needs-based travel than, uh, than, than leisure. And when you say needs-based travel, can you define that a bit? And what are the needs that people are sort of and leveraging for, for your type of units? Yeah, so we would say that our stays fall into three types of categories. The first are those that are more than 30 days. Those tend to be relocation services. So it could be an insurance company, someone who's had damage to their house, water damage, fire damage. The insurance company has to put them up uh, until they repair their home. Could be, you know, someone's moving into an area, they've, you know, hadn't had time, particularly given the kind of challenges in the broader housing market, they haven't closed on their, you know, future home in that market and they need a place to stay while they decide what community, what, you know, what neighborhood they want to live in, which specific house they want, 
And so then they'll pick up, you know, longer term stays for that. So it's, it's that kind of relocation work. Second category is the kind of one to four week stay. That's heavily populated by traveling workers, typically in the kind of trades or blue collar space. So traveling electricians, plumbers, construction workers often have found, you know, that it's preferable to stay in a home where they can you know, have their vehicles and have a kitchen and, you know, much more affordable than getting three or four or five hotel rooms for the same work crew. Uh, and so we'll pick up that business in that kind of one to four week stay. And then our sub four weeks, sub one week stay is really kind of market dependent. So if you're in, you know, Columbia, South Carolina, it tends to be a lot of traffic surrounding the University of South Carolina, or there's a military base there that has graduations. If you're in, you know, military base, it tends to be driven by, you know, some sort of military traffic. And then across all of the markets, interestingly enough, the single most common reason why people stay with us for under one week is actually funerals. Um, which could be a little bit sad, but is also, we find it really, you know, we're really proud of the fact that we get to help families in those difficult times. And if you just think about it, a wedding is planned. And so you get a room block and it's a very festive occasion. A funeral tends to you know, not be as planned and families want to kind of coalesce together, share a meal. And uh, so we find that, you know, short-term rentals tend to be a really good fit for that. Uh, and we certainly enjoy uh, and take pride in serving those families at that time. As you describe this, it sort of harked me back to my sort of hotel days of like how a hotel would generally layer in business. So you get group travel, booking far out in advance, then leisure transient, and then business transient, and sort of last minute bookers. And that that sort of leads to increased profitability given, and you can get the groups in, get <laughs> get a good base of business, and then layer on the more profitable types of business and as it comes in and you sort of know what the lead times are. Assuming and some of the longer term stays versus and the funerals and sub one week stays has entirely different sort of lead times of how far in advance people are sort of booking that type of stays. And then otherwise, like if you <laughs> your house floods or you have a plumbing incident or an ice storm or or something that sort of causes that need, it could be more sort of last minute. So how do you guys sort of think about all those, that type of demand that you serve, which sounds amazing that you can serve all those different types of demand and not be sort of relying on any one type of traveler into your sort of overall revenue management strategy and how you go about pricing and filling those units? Yeah. So you know, we would, I would say that, you know, compared to a traditional vacation rental management company that may have a really long booking lead time, our booking lead time is really short because one thing that characterizes both the long-term insurance stays, the remote work crews, and the necessity-based travel is that they all three have a tendency to kind of come last minute, right? So if I'm, you know, I don't have, I didn't know that my house was going to have a leak or mold or a fire or whatever else might happen. So I'm then needing to find a place to stay quickly, right? It's not, I'm planning out a month or two in advance. Similarly on the work crews, you might think that those tend to plan further out, but we find that's of all our groups, those often, those reservations are often made on Saturday or Sunday for a check-in on Monday for like two or three weeks. And it's, you know, they're based on how the, you know, some of it's weather dependent, some of it's around whether the budgets come in for do the job. And a lot of these temp, these uh, travel work crews, right, tend to surge in when there's a big need, right? Because often the projects will try to staff locally and then either they're behind schedule or whatever else and they need to surge in external labor. And so it has a tendency to be kind of last minute on call type stuff. And then certainly, you know, so of the three, the shorter term stays actually tend to book out further in advance which creates a little bit of a challenge for us because then it's like, do I take a nice, you know, reservation for a football game for a football weekend in Columbia, South Carolina at a high ADR for two or three days, it's like a month out, or do I hold thinking that everyone else has booked up all of their, all of those weekends, right? For that high travel event, bet that I will be able to by holding my calendar open still catch those two or three days, maybe not quite as a high of an ADR, but then also take advantage of I'm the only calendar that's left that'll facilitate a 
six week stay, right? Which is much more profitable. That's the game we're constantly playing. And, you know, we, we had a really good lock on it when we had a more stable, stable base of supply to work from, particularly in 2020 and 2021. What became challenging or stable or declining supply source, what obviously became challenging through 2022 and certainly in 2023 is, is as supplies really ticked up, you know, whereas in the past we were very confident that that last man standing approach to pricing would always yield the highest results because there was just not enough inventory and we could kind of maintain our prices and really hold to look for those longer term reservations. What we're now finding is that there, with all the, you know, with the increase in supply relative to demand, you know, we can't always be kind of set on that one approach to pricing. And sometimes we do have to go ahead and take, you know, the weekend bookings a couple, several weeks in advance, uh, even if it then means we aren't able to capture, you know, a long-term reservation on that listing. Yeah. So maybe digging into that a bit more on terms of just and current health of the market that you're seeing out there in terms of an overall booking activity and maybe any major differences that you're seeing across the markets on which ones tend to be performing better? Like, is it entirely supply driven or are there other factors you're seeing playing in there? Um, yeah, I think that supply is the biggest. I mean, we have, we, we have not seen big swings in demand, right? Demand mm -hmm. I mean, demand has kind of gradually increased everywhere, and we have not seen demand increase a lot more in Montgomery than Columbia versus Birmingham versus Huntsville. We've seen the demand, you know, kind of rise and fall relatively consistently across our markets. The big variable is supply, for sure. So in a, in a, in a market that has more regulatory constraints or housing prices are less conducive to new entrants or something along those lines. We've seen better rep, you know, rev par stay stronger because it's, you know, created a barrier for more entry on the supply side. And in markets where we have, you know, that have, don't have that sort of regulatory constraint or don't have, you know, then we've seen more supply flood in and, and deteriorate the rev par a little bit. So maybe just a level set and how many properties you have, how many markets are you in? We've got about 550. And across how many markets? kind of 15 or so core markets. And then we've got some periphery markets, but I'd say like, you know, 15 or so core markets. And when you s sort of think about growing your supply, is it an approach of you like those 15 core markets and you're looking to grow within your existing markets? Or are you guys l looking to continue to expand into more markets? And, and how are you thinking about, I'm which markets you would expand into? Um, I think that, you know, we would look for markets. Uh, we're trying to stay more kind of focused on the Southeast. So I think that's one key point. And then within the Southeast, looking for markets that have, you know, a couple of different sources of that needs-based travel. So again, it could be military base. It could be a major hospital. You know, we found uh, markets that are next to large hospital systems to be very helpful and university towns. So like a market, you know, a good one that would come up that we're not in currently be Tuscaloosa, Alabama, right? We're in mm -hmm. Huntsville, Birmingham, uh, Montgomery, but not in Tuscaloosa yet. And so that would be one where we would you know, be interested in, in seeing if we could enter there because it's proximate to our other markets and offers, you know, many of the sort of demand drivers that we're interested in. Yeah. So and given that you're in so many markets, and do you have a sort of full team in each of those markets? Are you guys operating full service property managing, management in each market? Or is there some sort of level of service that you provide in each market? It really depends on um, kind of the number of properties we have there. So um, in a you know market, certainly if we've got 20 or more properties, then we're going to have some level of full-time staff across the kind of operations and maintenance. We we uh, do 1099 for most all of our cleaning. We don't really do in-house cleaning, but within a given market, whether it tends to be more maintenance focused or operations focused, uh, certainly once we get up to like 40 or plus homes, then we're going to have both ops and maintenance teams in a smaller market. The ideal scenario is one in which you have an ops person that's also capable of doing basic maintenance functions. So that's kind of what we're looking for. But, you know, in a market of, 
20, 25 homes, you know, we'll probably have one FTE. Once you get up to like 50 homes or so, we'll probably have two. So digging maybe a bit further in supply of I mean, how you guys are growing your supply, is it entirely property management? Do you guys own your own homes? I and mean, are you taking out leases yourself? Sort of how, how does your supply picture look? We have a mix of three types of homes. We have traditional third-party managed. We mm-hmm. own some homes through what we would call affiliated prop codes. So it is, you know, we have a management company that then manages for a bunch of these kind of affiliated prop codes that have bought homes specifically for the purpose of having us manage them as short-term rentals. And then the third group would be the rental arbitrage uh, or master leasing approach where we own some homes, we'll sign a three to five year lease and turn around and sublease. So those are the kind of three types of models that we do. And when you think about your growth going forward, is there anyone that sort of pops out of probably be the fastest source of supply growth going forward? Yeah, I think in the current market, you'd have to say that third party management is going to be need to be the bulk of the growth and in inventory just because of where interest rates are, the fact that home prices have remained high or increased despite the interest rates, and considering some of the revenue rep par challenges that we've faced as a result of the increase in supply, it makes it harder to pencil for numbers to pencil on the asset ownership side, which means better to kind of pivot and and, and do more third party management. And when you think think about the type of owners that are signing with you, is it people that are buying homes for specifically bringing into short-term rentals, or is it people with existing assets that they're looking to transition into short-term rentals, maybe versus a long-term rental or versus using it themselves? Any trend there? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there was a big, you know, basically in 2021, you know, people made a killing in short-term rentals. Uh, (laughs) Certainly uh, folks in our markets who had these sorts of, utility style homes, right? When, you know, it was not as big of a surge in vacation. I mean, you actually probably know better than I do, but my sense was relatively, it was less of a big surge in vacation markets where there had always been this supply of vacation homes. The big change became, you know, Airbnb in particular, but also Verbo and other sites, making it more common for if someone was traveling to a Huntsville or a Birmingham or a Mobile or a Columbus to stay in a, in a short-term rental as opposed to staying in a hotel. Mm-hmm. That's where we saw the huge run-ups in demand relative to supply. Uh, and so I think, you know, everybody heard how much money was made in 2021. And so then everybody and their brother started buying short-term rentals and transitioning the, or buying long-term rentals or other properties and transitioning them into short-term rentals. And then what we saw is that then, you know, probably went too far. You went from having, you know, cap rates in the high teens, low twenties, you know, down a cap rate profile from an asset owning perspective that's much more similar to traditional long term rentals. And so as that yield margin is compressed, we're now starting to see people sell, you know, sell homes that they bought for short term rentals or convert them back to long term rentals. We've even converted some of our own homes back to long term rentals because whereas in twenty twenty one, you know, basically pick a house on the street and I can guarantee it'll make more money as a short-term rental than a long-term rental come to 2023 depends. It might be better off as a long-term rental. Yeah. So I mean, I haven't heard a lot of sort of companies sort of build to your scale in these type of markets. I definitely see in, in some of these markets, people with sort of, I'm maybe five to 10 properties. They sort of build some and economies of scale in, in, in the markets that they're in, manage some properties for some friends, do some initial sort of growth there. But when you think about your competition, I and mean, who do you see as I and mean, you're competing with for both guests and for, for owners? Is it other sort of property managers out there or, or do you see what you're doing is unique? Um, I think that what we're doing is, is very unique in the sense of we're a multi-market utility slash needs-based travel management company, right? Um, And so there are many operators out there who manage vacation rental units across multiple markets. Uh, And there are people out there who manage, you know, kind of utility style travel within an individual market. But what we've not encountered much of is someone who has 
you know, this more needs based travel focus mm -hmm. and it has kind of spread that out across multiple markets at scale. Uh, and so that's kind of where we think our unique lane is within the industry is that nexus of needs based slash utility travel with multi market. Yeah. And you sort of mentioned regulation for a second, but it seems like it's got a sort of double edged sword here of one, it, and being in the Southeast and going to the type of markets you're going to, assume many of them have very sort of, say, liberal regulation of not a lot of regulation towards I mean, short term rentals or, or asset use uh, types. Where one hand, that's great to be able to expand, but in the other, it's, it makes it where I mean, as much supply and wants to come in generally can. So how do you think about regulation? Does that sort of play into your expansion strategy? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that probably our, our preferred markets are ones where there is a reasonable regulatory regime in place, right? Uh, and it may require that you meet certain health and safety standards. Maybe there's a cap on density noise ordinance, whatever it might be, right? You have to go through an application process, but you're then reasonably assured if I, if I buy this property or I take on this management client and I'm a good actor and I do the right things and I get a, man, a permit in place, then I will be able to operate. And then if the city comes back after the fact and decides to reduce the number of, you know, uh, permits that are issued or stop issuing additional permits, then at least the asset that I have in place at that time Mm -hmm. is, uh, is grandfathered in. And then, you know, barring that, what we prefer is to be in states that have what we'd call grandfather clauses that essentially say, if you're up and running and the municipality subsequently makes a change in its ordinance that, you know, they can say, okay, now you have to get a permit. Now you have to comply with these different rules, but they can't just say, okay, you have to shut down, right? Because there was not a restriction in place when you bought the asset, made the business decision uh, that said you can't operate. So yeah, what we don't like is people changing. We, I don't like local Politburo's ability to uh, come back and change the rules uh, after the fact, after you've already made an investment. You know, certainly if we know the rules on the front end, we'll, you know, work to comply with them. And if they change the rules afterwards about what's required to operate, we'll continue to comply. But what I don't think is right and what we really push back hard against is whenever cities or municipalities come in and try to change the rules and then penalize people who weren't operating illegally, just there weren't rules to start with. Right. Have you seen any sort of subsequent increase in sort of regulation out there? It's I know it's been a hot topic with and sort of the changes in New York, but has there been any sort of increased activity in the markets you guys are operating in? Yeah, I mean, there is. And so I think that's, that's, that's one we're constantly seeing. I mean, I'm, you know, and, 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 and even in these municipalities that are within states that have grandfather clauses, we'll see them try to come up with, you know, creative ways to get around the fact they'll say, oh, well, you know, the real issue is, is that you're, act, you're operating as a commercial business and you'd have a business license. So you're in violation. And so then you say, oh, well, what makes this, you know, what makes a lease that's 31 days not commercial activity and one that's 20 days commercial activity? Right? Mm -hmm. If they haven't defined that in their code to start with, then you say, okay, you've now issued guidance that says, you know, setting aside whether or not I think it's an arbitrary and unreasonable distinction to say whether 20 days stays versus 30 days stays are the delineation of commercial activity. You know, if you didn't clearly specify that in the first instance, then it's not, you know, in my view, it doesn't really hold water. Yeah. And in the conversations you had, I, and I would assume that and the type of lodging that you guys are providing is one that and city officials have a hard time saying isn't needed in their community of housing, military, housing people that have that needs-based stay of and had a plumbing issue and construction workers, traveling workers, doctors, nurses, like that there really is a, a need for this type of lodging and you got, and you're able to serve it. And that is a net benefit for the community. Do, do you see pushback there? Yeah. I mean, my favorite one is, I mean, I was looking, actually, I got one in today. I won't mention the municipality, but someone, you know, municipality sent us a, you know, basically said, Hey, these one or two homes that you've got, you know, are in violation of this. And so the pushback to the city is, 
okay, what complaints have been received about the property? Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you've received no complaints from the property and we've been doing this for a couple of years, then what's your basis for trying to make a change in policy, right? Mm -hmm. I get it. If one operator is catering to bachelor, you know, if you're in Vegas and you cater to bachelor parties or Nashville and you cater to bachelorette parties and you're, you know, it's creating a huge disturbance for the neighborhood all the time. Okay. That's one thing. But if, again, if you're in this needs-based travel group, why wouldn't you? I mean, the answer is a lot of it. It's hotel lobby that drives a lot of it. And then mm -hmm. it's the inevitable Karen, right? Who has, you know, she tends to be just calling a spade a spade. It tends to be when a short-term rental or short-term rentals show up in nicer, higher end neighborhoods in the community, which is not where we put our homes. Our homes are for the most part in more working class and transitioning neighborhoods, given the fact that we cater towards a needs-based travel, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, Karen is, uh, or you know, it doesn't have to be Karen, it can be Steve or whoever else, right, is retired and has a lot of extra time on their hands and is particularly upset about the fact that, uh, you know, this short, this one short-term rental in their neighborhood may or may not be causing legitimate issues and then decides that this is going to be their pet project in retirement and that they're going to go after, you know, that operator. And then by extension, you know, the county commission, city council, whatever else officials, you know, get tired of listening to this, you know, person who then gets others riled up. And then they typically try to loop in the affordable housing crowd under the kind of guys that, uh, you know, 0.5% of the housing stock that's used as a short-term rental is somehow what's driving the affordability crisis in the country and not, you know, interest rates and a lack of inventory. Um, but anyway, so they all come together. And then the simplest thing is to just say, okay, no short term rentals in residential neighborhoods, right? Without a distinction between, you know, in my view, what it should be is like, in the absence of valid complaints, you should be able to continue to operate as you want to. Yes, if your neighbors are calling in, you know, every weekend to complain about noise, to complain about parking, that's one thing, but my pushback to the city in those instances is you have noise ordinances, you have parking ordinances, you have lawn care maintenance ordinances. So like whatever it is that the short-term rental tenants may be doing that is upsetting the neighborhood, there is almost certainly already a code enforcement measure in place to penalize that activity. And the real issue is that the city code enforcement isn't out enforcing those codes. And the simplest way to get around it is to just deny someone their private property rights by saying, well, you know, you can rent it for 31 days, but not, you know, seven days. My other favorite one, I'll tell you that I love to go to city councils, particularly in the South. This probably wouldn't help me a ton in San Francisco, but I love showing up in conservative city councils in the Southeast and telling them, you know, I started this business while I was deployed in Afghanistan, scaled it while I was deployed in Ukraine. And now that I've come home, you know, the... Local Politburo is here to deny me of my private property rights. So they love that. <laughs> yeah. In my prior life at CBRE, we worked in, for a, a lot of sort of government consulting contracts. And one thing I sort of learned there and would be interested if this applies to your business is and to be able to accommodate government sort of military travelers, there's some additional sort of hoops maybe that you have to sort of walk through to get your properties approved. Is that something you guys have to do and, and maybe differentiate you a bit in terms of the guests that you're able to uh, accommodate? Oh, yes. So typically we, we, we cannot get put on the military's official lodging sites, right? Because okay. the hotel lobby has been very effective at uh, putting in place rules. So for example, you know, one of the rules would say that you need a sprinkler system, right? assuming that it's in a hotel and then the hotel lobby has been very effective in saying, Oh, well, if they don't meet, you know, this short term rental doesn't have a sprinkler system. It's not safe. Never mind if it's a one bedroom, one bath, one floor, yeah. floor <laughs> tiny home, you know, yeah. it's not safe. And you know, they don't have, there's nobody manning the front door. That's one of my other favorite ones, right? Like you have to have 24 hour, you know, presence around the front door. Well, okay. You know, that's not so, we actually don't do a lot of what we call official military travel. 
Okay. So that will typically run through the hotels. What we will do is when military families are traveling, they're given discretionary funds. You know, if they're changing station or in certain other instances, they're given discretionary funds that they can just go book wherever they want to. And in those instances, then we capture a lot of that business and can provide them with the receipts that they need to take back. But for official travel, typically goes through hotels, you know, thanks, mm-hmm. to the, thanks to the hotel lobby. But maybe something in the future that... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we would, we would love to explore, you know, an exception for a better known business uh, that's housing, you know, military, military members and, and yeah. veterans. But we'll see whether... My guess is that's... It, it is a long slog to get through the, uh, you know, and PCS at ease has, has tried to like navigate this for a while. And it's just very difficult to work through as someone who was in the military, trying to do anything with the military is a nightmare. So, <laughs> and that, that that's, and what we had built a great business on was we had quite a few veterans on staff that sort of knew how to operate in that system. And, and they, they built a great business doing that, but it's, a nightmare to sort of uh, try to work through. So we're we're coming up on time. Um, I I'm love to ask um, questions on data, and I've got maybe my my last two questions for you as we look to to wrap up is, and they're both around metrics. And first is, what's one of your favorite metrics to track in your business, and sort of why? And then number two is any macro indicators you sort of follow either on the lodging industry or the economy as a whole that just give you a sense of sort of health of everything out there? Yeah. I mean, RevPAR is not, it's not going to be novel. If I had to pick up, I'm trying to think if there's a more novel metric that I would say that I like to look at. I guess one thing that I would say that's maybe unique to our business that I try to get anybody who works with us in revenue management or, or others to look at is I really push people to not look at forward-looking occupancy but to look at rearward occupancy because of how much of our business is last minute, you know, we can make poor decisions in terms of pushing rate down too low. If we're just looking out at forward occupancy and being terrified by, you know, too much availability and what really should drive our decision-making process to reduce price is if over the trailing 30, 60, 90, we've been consistently failing to meet our occupancy targets. I would say that would be my twist on RevPAR. And then, in terms of macro data, I mean, I think for us, particularly given the extent to which we own a lot of the homes, just the home prices and interest rates tend to be a really, I think, big indicator for me. And I think that in the utility markets where we operate days on market for homes and how quickly homes are selling will also be a really good indicator because you've got a lot of folks now who decided, okay, I want to sell my rental, right? But it's a more challenging environment to sell, right? Even though there's still very few homes on the market from an inventory standpoint and prices have stayed high, days on market have also increased because people just can't afford the, you know, home you know, the payments with the new interest rates. So I think that like that to me, I think if you see interest rates come down or for whatever reason, home, you know, days on market for homes start getting shorter, and I think you'll see more and more people who have short-term rentals, particularly in these utility markets, deciding to go ahead and sell them. And that'll probably clear out a lot of the excess supply and return the kind of supply and demand characteristics to a little bit more of a normalized state. All right. So, and that, uh, and maybe goes into my final question. I and mean, we still see, I mean, the fastest supply growth out there in the industry still, I mean, north of 15% right now in these utility markets. And it, it still continues to surprise me that there's so much supply going in. It's still the fastest growing demand areas as well, but I mean, occupancy is clearly coming down and it's still well elevated to 2018, 2019 levels, but it's seen the I mean, biggest drop from the highs of 2021. So you're probably closest to the demand that, than anyone else of, do you see like in next three to five years that there's and the demand in this in these type of markets is continue to grow and that this is maybe a a growth aspect of the business or is it maybe three five percent growth we can sustain and and overall growth in the economy growth and people coming into these markets but the sort of fifteen to twenty percent growth that we've seen over the past two years is is not sustainable. I think the way I think about utility markets and the reason I remain positive about them is that because the owners of 
the assets for short-term rentals and utility markets are not using them for leisure or personal purposes, personal reasons, right? And why is that important? It's important because if I own a vacation home in Destin or Vail or wherever else, because I wanted to go and vacation there and my revenues decline, I'm unlikely to then like sell the home, right? And in many cases, even if I did sell the home, whoever bought it would still use it as a vacation rental, right? So there are, I would be surprised if there was a much more of a correction in supply and demand in those markets, just because the nature of the homes and who owns them and what their priorities are. Versus if I own a home in Birmingham or Memphis or Columbus or Columbia or wherever else, chances are that is an investment property, not a you know, personal leisure property. And so if the highest and best use for that capital then becomes to convert it to a long-term rental or to sell it, then I'll do it. And I think the supply will clear. And so then your fundamental question you're asking is, is what is the yield premium that an owner expects for short-term versus long-term rentals? And I think that's then where the really interesting thing that we look at is in our utility markets, the percentage of homes that are professionally managed tend to be under 10%, if not under 5%, which means that that owner operator is the one who's answering the calls at 11 o'clock at night on Friday, who's having to deal with the cleaners, with the bed bugs, with the, all of the drama that goes into turning a house 50 or 60 times a year, as opposed to once every two years. And so there's gotta be, you know, there's, there's a significant yield premium there. And we think that yield premium will be somewhere between four to 500 bips on an unlevered cap rate basis. That's where we think that ultimately, even as the more supply comes on, demand will continue to go up. But ultimately, you know, we think that because these are primarily investment properties as opposed to for personal leisure, you'll see that balance, you know, normalize and regulations and every, you know, I think there's just a variety of things the utility markets is still the kind of wild west. You know, if, 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 if vacation rentals in general is the wild west, then like, you know, utility markets is like the Yukon territory in Alaska, you know, it's like truly wild. And so I think you'll see much wider, wilder swings, you know, people in utility markets did much better even than vacation markets in 21, at least from my perspective, maybe not from a rev, but from a cap rate basis, looking from an asset ownership standpoint. And then, you know, they're going to get harder, get hit harder as supply kind of corrects, but I think you'll see supply correct faster and then ultimately normalize out in a higher cap rate basis than what you would see either in long-term rentals in those utility markets or in short-term rentals and vacation markets. And assuming that yield premium that you get in these type of markets is going to give you enough sort of buffer to then hire a property management company and not have to do it yourself. Right. It sounds like a great, great uh, thesis to me. I'm really excited to sort of follow you guys' progress over these next few years. Love to have you back maybe in a year or two and and see how it's all going. And Joe, uh, want to thank you. Last question. How can people find Patriot Family Homes? How can they find more information? Any sort of contact you want to uh, give to the audience? Yeah, you can go to patriotfamilyhomes.com. And uh, there's a kind of contact us button, whether you're looking for property management, you're looking to partner with us. You can also email me. My, my personal email is joe at patriotfamilyhomes.com and always happy to field questions. And we're actively looking to start partnering with more uh, local market property managers in the utility space and to start building out a network and, and, and looking at doing some acquisitions there as well. Awesome. Well, Joe, thanks again. And I'll see you at the next conference. All right. Thanks. See you.